Okay. Do you have your own uh, like uh, PDF file of notes from from last, last week? week? No, last I never. Week? I never made notes for those. Yeah. yeah. That's why I asked you guys for. Well, I didn't yeah. know like if you had them before. No. Oh no. no. <laughs> But I didn't get out doing notes. Notes are a pain. Um, although, ironically, today, I'm sure, I'm sure I have way too much in the way of notes for to, to get through today. But whatever I don't get through, we'll just do on Monday. All right. Um, so, oh, that's. <laughs> that was there the other day. Yeah, you can see it because now it has a fade set instead. Ah. <laughs> what, do you guys do that? Oh, uh, you did? Yeah. Oh. I found a broken sunglasses on the drawer inside that. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very creative of you. Oh. Look at the drawing. <laughs> oh. Um, okay. Apparently no one else has noticed it enough to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, Even where a non broken sunglass. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, today um, we're going to focus on one of the certain linear algebra aspects that will be important for solving this term linear problems. So, I'll give you some context first um, for why I'm going to cover what we're about to cover. Um, That is the solutions of um, okay. The solution of Stern Leadville problems um, for a set of Label Bn. Um, so, countably infinite set. Or it might start from zero to infinity depending on what is uh, uh, convenient. And it's these kind of functions that make it very easy to solve um, time dependent PDEs that separate into a Sturm Liouville problem and some other ODE for uh, time. Um, so, the idea is. If you take your initial condition and express it in terms of these eigenfunctions, uh, then it's easy to get the um, uh, coefficients. Um, now, the next section, 6.4, is when I'll talk all about the different properties that have been proven about eigenfunctions as term level problems. But to set that up, I need to get into um, what it means to be, what's to have a set of orthonormal functions. What does that even mean? We're talking about functions instead of vectors, and what are some of the important properties of uh, um, that these kind of functions have in general beyond just term Liouville problems. So, um, so our goal is to express our solution u of x t as the sum of coefficients that depend on time times these eigenfunctions that are functions of x. And these time-dependent coefficients um, based on the initial conditions, so that's part of it, as, at least at t equals 0, um, and also the time-dependent ODE that you get by separation of variables. Um, and as we get to towards the end of a chapter, like in this se section 6.5, 6.6, um, this relationship will be made um, more precise. So the idea is we're going to first get a solid understanding of these functions first um, before we move on to the rest about solving time-dependent PDE using separation of variables. Okay. Um, so 
Um, and this happened some last semester too in the ODE class 605. Now and then there's this need for a more linear algebra day, and that is today. Um, and actually, it might not be a, a, a bad idea if, uh, if someone wants to be um, want, want to keep it out to make sure that I move a computer every single time. Um, at least this time I'm remembering, but as we get further in, as you well know, that's why I have a case. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Apparently, it's like every single one of my students has cracked a screen, and I have not yet. <laughs> what? Not every single one of your students. Not every yes. single one. Mine, I got mine fixed. Though. A lot. Believe it or not, I have never cracked my phone screen. A preponderance of them. <laughs> of all people, of all people, I haven't. Um, that is remarkable. <laughs> I know. And, yeah, maybe it's because you just have access to all everything else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, I first need to discuss vector spaces and more specifically uh, function spaces. Um, right. um, and these are sort of concepts that come up in many different classes. Um, uh, even stuff that have nothing to do with differential equations. So um, it's good to firm your foundation. Also, if you never really picked it up in your own linear algebra class, then this can help uh, fill that gap. Um, okay. So first, vector spaces in general. Um, not the, I won't go over the entire definition, but um, includes a set of vectors. Um, for example, a uh, set of all vectors in n-dimensional space, or the set of all continuous functions on some domain. Also an example of a set that produces the actual vectors involved. Um, we'll mostly be dealing with vectors that are functions. Um, but all this, of course, applies to vectors in Rn or Cn. Um, with two operations, addition, and scalar multiplication. And very important, the vector space must be closed with respect to these two operations, similar to the notion of closure and group theory. Some of two vectors um, in a set must be in a set. Uh, the scalar vector is in a set. So for instance, the unit sphere is not closed under either of these operations because uh, that consists of all unit vectors that have magnitude uh, uh, magnitude one. If you add any two of those, you get a vector of a different length, and so on. Um, okay, there, there must be a zero vector. There um, has to be an identity element for multiplication, um, etc. So all the expected properties um, uh, must apply. Okay. Um, now, um, I want to give a few examples of function spaces, since those are ones that are of most interest to us. Okay. Um, So uh, function space is denoted by Pn. Um, that's the space of all polynomials. Of degree less than or equal to n. Because you take two polynomials of that kind of degree and you add them, you definitely will not get something of degree greater than n. Um, same is true if you multiply polynomial by some scalar. Uh, that's not going to bump up the, uh, the degree. Um, Okay. Um, 
So, so it's easy to convince yourself that this set of polynomials is closed under addition and um, uh, scale multiplication. Um, another good example is a uh, set of all power series. Um, that are convergent on some intervals. So this is an example I use minus 1 to 1. So all functions of this form, where the coefficients a sub n satisfy um, that the um, power series um, has a uh, radius of convergence that at least includes minus 1 to 1. Because if you add two such power series that converge that interval, the sum will converge also. Um, also, scaling power series keeps the convergence um, on that interval. Um, OK. And one that's closer to our own interest, uh, what I mentioned earlier, the set of continuous functions on some interval AB. And again, you can convince yourself that this kind of set is closed because if you have two continuous functions and add them, um, that the result is continuous. If you multiply a continuous function by a constant, again, it's continuous. Um, so all, all these properties that define these sets are preserved under addition um, and uh, multiplication. Okay. Um, all right, um, and we'll, come, we'll keep coming back to these examples as we get through um, more concepts. And that's actually what I need to do now is go through some important uh, uh, linear algebra concepts that we're going to need. I'm going to describe now, um, the next stretch applies to any kind of vector space, whether it's a function space or a space of what I might call ordinary vectors, such as um, uh, Rn. So let's use capital V to refer to a general vector space. in your vector space, v1, v2, etc. And we could we come talk about a finite or an infinite set of these vectors. Um, multiplying them by constants, c1 and c2, uh, and, and so forth. So, so the, the c sub i, those are scalars. I'm using the term scalar because I could be referring to a real number or a complex number. doesn't matter. Um, so anytime you're um, combining vectors in this manner, um, say that V is a linear combination of, of the VIs. Um, and this is very important for linear ODEs and PDEs because um, if the differential equation is linear, then any linear combination of solutions is also a solution. That's for, sorry, not just linear, but homogeneous linear equations. Um, we, we have that property. Um, we'll be taking linear combinations of uh, solutions of PDEs um, to find, you know, finding a right linear combination to satisfy initial conditions. So, those, so the notion of linear combination is, we've seen it already, it just haven't really 
always been referring to it by that name. Um, okay. Um, now, um, two very important concepts. A set of such vectors, well, again, whether finite or infinite, you know, v1, v2, etc., is yes. Linearly independent if whenever you have a linear combination is equal to zero. Okay, that's good. That's something. It's, it's good. Oh, I thought you were about to say but. No, no, no. I screwed no, something up. <laughs> no, no, you haven't. As I was going to say, it's good that some of you remember. Um, yeah, linear combination is equal to zero if and only if what? All the coefficients are equal to zero. All the coefficients are equal to zero. <laughs> <laughs> this is not my favorite stuff, so in our remember, I get excited. Okay. Um, so that's the only way to get a linear combination equal to zero, but all the coefficients themselves have to be zero. Now, um, the implication going this way is always true, but when it goes both ways, that's when you have linearly um, independent. Um, and... Um, another co uh, consequence of that uh, definition is if you have some vector v being a linear combination of these vectors, um, that the, uh, the choice of coefficient that gives you v is unique. Uh, so there's only one possible linear combination that gives you a certain vector. Um, so in other words, if you're setting up a system of linear equations to solve for C1, C2, etc., uh, for a given vector v, uh, so if the coefficients are unknown, you're trying to find them, that system will have a unique solution. Okay. Um, all right. And that's also going to be very helpful for us for solving uh, PDEs. Um, okay. So that's... One important concept. Another um, is that to give us, again, the same kind of set of vectors, v1, v2, etc., spans the vector space v if um, you take any vector, little v, in the vector space, capital V. that V is a linear combination of the vectors in this set. Um, so uh, another way of writing this is capital V is equal to the span of V1, V2, etc. Um, so a span um, is a set of all possible linear combinations of v1, v2, and so on. Now, the, the thing is, um, these concepts somewhat go together, but one does not apply the other. So for instance, you can have a set of linearly independent vectors within your vector space. It might not span the entire space, because maybe there are certain vectors in the space that cannot be expressed as linear combinations of these. Um, uh, or, you may have a set of vectors that span the space, but maybe the linear combination that gives you little v here is not unique. So in other words, you have a spanning set, but those vectors that are spanning are not linearly independent. Um, okay. Um, so actually, I'll give a couple examples. So let's just use R3. Um, so a set of vectors, 1, 0, 0. And 0, 1, 0 are linearly independent, but they do not span R3. Because if you take any linear combination of these two vectors, no matter what linear combination it is, their components are always going to be 0. So if, for instance, the vector 0, 0, 1 is not in the span of, of these two vectors. Um, 
On the other hand, um, I take these vectors. And these four vectors, these span are three, but they're not linear, linearly independent. Uh, the reason is, all I'd have to do is um, I can take uh, um, let's see, if I, if I add these two vectors together um, and divide by minus two, um, I get this vector. So, so this vector, the fourth one, is a linear combination of the first two. Um, so um, it's kind of like a Goldilocks problem. Here I have too few vectors. Here I have too many. So if I have three linearly independent vectors, then um, that will actually span um, R3. Um, and that leads to the um, essential concept that we need of a basis. So the basis of a vector space is the, the set of linearly independent vectors that spans V. So if you put both concepts together. Um, so the idea is that you can describe all vectors in the space in a unique way, as a unique linear combination of the vectors um, uh, in your basis. Um, now, um, so any vector in space then V is a linear combination of the vectors in your uh, basis, so I'll label the basis V1, V2, etc. Um, and the set of coefficients is unique. So there's exactly one linear combination of these basis vectors that gives you your vector little v. Okay. Um, now, if your vector space is finite dimensional, like Rn, for instance, then dim of v, dimension of v, is the number of vectors in the basis. So any vector space that has a basis can have infinitely many bases, or many ways to recombine basis vectors to get a new one. Um, but all bases must have the same number of elements, and that's the dimension. Um, so for instance, the dimension of Rn is equal to n. Um, we're mainly going to be interested in infinite dimensional um, uh, vector spaces, <coughs> or uh, especially uh, function spaces. Um, well, but another finite dimensional example, the dimension of the vector space Pn, all polynomials of degree less than or equal to n, is n plus 1. So basis would be 1x, x squared, up to x to the n. That's called the monomial basis. Um, and there's an obvious way to take any polynomial degree up to n. It's obvious what the coefficients of a polynomial are the coefficients of this linear, this unique linear combination. Um, 
And there are other bases, for instance, I could choose maybe all Chebyshev or Legendre polynomials up to degree n. And those would be bases also uh, that have certain nice properties. But well, any bases I have is going to have n plus 1 um, elements. Okay. Um, uh, the power series example I gave earlier. So the monomial basis 1, x, x squared, x cubed, all the way up to infinity. That is a basis. Um, you can show those are linearly independent. Okay. Um, um, so, um, okay, another, so, so one example is um, for related PDEs. Space of all um, two pi periodic functions. Um, so basis consists of um, one cosine x sine x cosine 2x, sine 2x, and so on. So cosine of any integer times x, uh, I should say positive integer times x, and also sine of any positive integer times x. All of those functions are literally independent. Um, in fact, uh, soon we'll come to orthogonality. They're orthogonal to one another, which is stronger than linear independence. And um, any two pi periodic function uh, can be expressed as a um, linear combination of these functions. Um, and um, this infinite series that you're going to get, or you're combining these functions, will converge at least at almost every point. Um, because you might think, what about a two pi periodic function that is discontinuous? Um, I mean, how could it because all of these functions are continuous, but um, it's a little more complicated when you're talking about an infinite linear combination, and we will talk about that um, when I get closer to the end of these notes. Okay. Um, so bases like these are going to be of particular interest uh, to us. Okay, but. Having a basis is just a starting point. If you have a basis for a certain vector space, you want to be able to get your coefficients, and that could be that could be difficult. Um, so, so we need so, so that's our big task that I'm going to get to now. Um, if you have a known basis, you know, v1, v2, etc., and you have a, a known vector v, but you want to know what the coefficients are. How do you get the coefficients? And we'd like to make that task easier if we can. Um, and at least uh, one of the nice things about stern liouville problems is they give us bases of functions to work with for which it is easy to get the coefficients. And it's we can prove that this is true for any regular stern liouville problem. I say regular stern liouville problem, um, singular stern liouville problems. Um, that's another story. Okay. So now we get to the essential operation of the inner product. Um, now, one type of inner product you already dealt with in calculus, the dot product. We've also seen this in physics class. Um, so you have two vectors, u and v, in Rn. Uh, so u dot v, dot product, they just multiply corresponding components. Ui times vi, and add them all up. 
um, it helps you obtain the angle between uh, u and v. Um, so in fact, the upper formula, what a physicist like to use, is the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v both sine theta. And if this were a numerical analysis class, I would be writing the two norm here. Uh, but, um, but outside of that setting, two norm is pretty much mainly what we deal with. Okay. I, um, I well. thought inner product and dot product were, te were the same. Inner product is, okay, a dot product is an example of an inner product. Inner product is more general. We just called it that in yeah. 610, just? Um, yeah. Because that's the only one we used. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, so the magnitude that we're using here is just sum of squares. All right, and, and in 610, it was the idea to contrast inner product with outer product. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, now, um, so here are the laws that inner product needs to satisfy, and this will apply not just for vector spaces like Rn, but also function spaces. Except for function spaces, we don't yet have a specific inner product like this dot product, but we will. Um, Okay, so um, okay, so properties that an inner pro a dot product is supposed to have. So I'll focus on that first. Um, so a dot product of a vector with itself is a magnitude squared. Uh, a dot product has linearity, um, so we can then distribute. Um, we have commutativity, at least for real vectors. Um, I'm going to be more general here. If um, really, when you switch the order of vectors in a dot product, you take the complex conjugate, which of course doesn't matter if vectors are real, but this, that way we covered the complex case too. Okay. Um, and finally. Um, Dot product would give a scalar. You could pull out the scalar, but because of property three, you have to be careful because now if I go the other way, if I have a constant multiplying u, again I could pull it out as long as I take the complex conjugate. So this last line is really property three with the two lines above it put together. Um, all right. Um, now, so number you know, would make equals zero if you and V are orthogonal. Yes, that is what I'm coming to next. Okay. <laughs> That's his way of saying. Are you like in my head or something? Or <laughs> if so, get out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if U and V are perpendicular, so based on this formula. Um, cosine theta is zero. And the state is the angle between them. So that means that the dot product is zero. And we say that u and v are orthogonal. And we'd like to generalize this notion from vectors in Rn to vectors in function spaces because it's going to be very convenient for us for the task I gave earlier. How do we find coefficients in a linear combination? Um, Okay. Um, so, so the question becomes, what about inner products on function spaces? Okay. Um, all right. Um, now, generally, function spaces that we're going to deal with, um, there's a certain domain of interest. Like, for instance, all continuous functions on the interval AB. Um, so you need to specify your domain. And that helps you to specify your um, 
your inner product also. Is that last one, do you consider it a property? Um, oh, uh, this? Yeah. No, uh, okay. not that it's not in this list. Well, that's, that, it wasn't, so that's why I was asking. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. This is like a set of conditions that an operation like a dot product should satisfy to be called an inner product. on your function space. So for instance, if you're dealing with uh, all 2 pi periodic functions, your chance area interval will be like 0 to 2 pi or minus pi to pi. Um, your first argument in your inner product, f in this case, must take the complex conjugate. And for the most part, we'll be dealing with real functions, so it's moot, but um, it's important to know that you need this. Times your second argument, r to g x. And you may have a weight function, which I'll call w of x, um, the weight function can never um, can never change sign um, on the interval. Um, in fact, um, in our stirrup legal problem, you might recall that we had coefficients p, q, and r. Uh, we will have inner products involving the weight function r at some point. Um, often the weight function will just be 1. Okay. We did this. What? We did this before. Familiar class. But, uh, 415. Yes. Yes. In fact, these are data from 415 notes. I remember this. Okay. Fine. Well, good. But. Are you probably the only one here who's taken that class? Or you, you, you took you took that class in 515. Did I take it with you? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't taken it. Is 415 PD? It's the second. Three. You were you almost took it? I did, yeah. yeah. Did. yeah. Did. And you took it the following year with with Hui Ching. So yeah. Okay, so so two people in this room have taken the class that I know of. So not very many. Okay. <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, so this satisfies the same kind of properties that you have over there. Um, so we have uh, linearity. Uh, you can distribute. Um, you have. Um, oh, I need, actually, I need. I didn't uh, that fully adapt my notation. I know, so I'll fix that later. So, so you switch, you take the complex conjugate. Um, yeah, in, um, in, in 415, 515, the inner product was expressed a little differently. Well, was, like, the book called it the scalar product, and it had a vertical bar. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I actually was going through these notes, removing all the vertical bars and replacing it with commas, but as I just saw, I missed one. Um, and you can pull out constants. So on the right, if it's on the right, you can go ahead and pull it out as is. Otherwise, when, if it's on the left, you pull out the complex conjugate. Um, okay, so we get these two together. Gives you that. Um, okay. Um, so, um, I think is I I don't have something corresponding to the first property for dot product about magnitude because I have not yet defined the magnitude of a function um, in a certain um, function space. Um, so, so so that's something that we need now. 
Um, so, um, so a function that takes in um, some vector in a function space and maps it to for real numbers. Um, okay, so so in this context, v is a function space, not just any old vector space. Okay. Um, well, actually, but well, it is for for our discussion here. But what I'm about to write actually applies just as well to a um, any vector space. So you can have a norm on that vector space. And by norm, I mean a valid notion of magnitude of a vector um, if it satisfies these three conditions. So first, the norm of a vector um, can never be negative. Um, and the only time that a norm of a vector is 0 is if the itself is a 0 vector. Um, although for functions, we will see that a function can have a norm of zero, even if it's not zero. For instance, like at an isolated point, like um, so. For instance, you have a function of zero, and then at one point in the intervals, defined to be something non-zero, um, because we're using integration to um, this define our magnitude. That that can still happen because. It's non-zero on a set of what's called measure zero. So in that sense, it's inconsequential. Um, if you multiply a vector by a scalar alpha, you can pull it out as long as you take the absolute value, or complex modulus if it's a complex number. Um, and finally, you have a triangle inequality that must be satisfied. So magnitude of sum is less than or equal to the sum of the magnitudes. Okay. So whether you're dealing with uh, um, Rn or some function space, to define a norm, you must have these three properties uh, be satisfied. Um, so the way you can do that on function spaces is you can define the norm of a function to simply be the inner product of a function with itself, square root. Um, so it's completely consistent with what we have with dot products of vectors in Rn, that the, dot pro the inner product of a function of itself is the magnitude squared, or norm squared. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay, um, and that's something that can be proven that all these properties are satisfied um, if you define the, uh, the norm in, in this manner. Except with the exception I gave that um, if a function is non-zero only on a set of measure zero, so for instance isolated points, the function itself is, is non-zero, but the norm could still be zero. Okay. Um, now, this leads us to certain types of function spaces of interest for expressing solutions of PDEs. Um, on which a, 
inner products. So summing this form that satisfies all the properties of an inner product. Um, and an induced norm. And what I mean by an induced norm is the norm is defined in terms of that inner product, whatever that inner product is. So you're taking square root of the inner product of itself. Okay. Um, now, um, I can go one step further. This is for, this is specific to function spaces. A Hilbert space is a function space that has inner products and an induced norm. We're taking the square root of the inner product of itself. Um, and there's one more condition. It has to be what is called complete. Um, and what I mean by um, complete um, is it has a basis. Functions v1, v2, etc. Um, such that um, any, actually, I'm going to call this Hilbert space H. So if we have any function phi in the Hilbert space, then it can be expressed as a linear combination. of these basis functions. <clears throat> okay. Um, because, so, so in other words, um, an inner product space, for instance, the infinite dimensional inner product space, is not necessarily guaranteed to have a basis. Um, so there may be vectors in the inner product space that cannot be expressed as uh, such a linear combination of whatever functions you choose. That's actually, so that would be an example that's called a pre-Hilbert space, if it's a function space, that's lacking in that completeness. Um, and I'm going to draw a parallel with, with how the term complete comes up elsewhere um, in terms of uh, sets of numbers. Um, the real numbers are said to be complete, um, whereas uh, the rational numbers are not. Um, Complete in this case means if you take any sequence of real numbers that converges, it's going to converge to a real number. Uh, whereas if you have uh, a sequence of rational numbers that converges, it might converge to an irrational number. For instance, you can easily construct a sequence of rational numbers that's meant to converge to you know, pi or square root of 2. Uh, so so we're, that's why we say the rationals are not complete, but the real numbers are. Okay, um, so similar notion of completeness here, that you can uh, define a set of vectors in your Hilbert space that describe every function in the space um, using this kind of um, expansion. Okay. Um, all right. Um, now, one example of um, such space that we're going to be using later, um, I'll just note it by E, A, B. Um, that is set of all piecewise continuous on continuous functions on the interval A, B. And the inner product is just the integral of f conjugate times g on uh, on a b. Um, 
Now I can go a little bit further. E sub R of AB, um, same idea, still same set of functions, P twice continuous functions, except the subscript R denotes a weight function. So we, use, we have a different inner product. F conjugate times G times R. So that gets included. And R must be positive and continuous um, on the interval AB. Um, now, um, what, I, what will be shown later, like actually when we get to the next section, um, so this EAB is just a special case of this one where R is equal to 1. Uh, so it'll be shown later um, that this function space is actually complete. So therefore it is a Hilbert space. Um, where the, um, I'll use a subscript R to indicate the wave function. So the norm of a function with wave function R is the inner product of its f of itself with wave function R, and you take the square root. Um, so it's not obvious now how this set is complete, because in order to show that a certain function space is complete, we need to be able to exhibit a basis for it and show that any such function, any piecewise continuous function, can be expressed as a linear combination of these basis functions. Um, so when we examine general theory of solutions of stern leoville problems um, is when we'll actually be able to arrive at, at this conclusion. So that's coming. Okay. All right. Um, now, um, so when we define um, the uh, inner product in this way, with, with or without a uh, weight function, um, one very important property that applies is a very well-known inequality that actually has several different names, depending on which textbook you're using. Okay. Uh, now, the most common name for this inequality is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Although I've seen it from referred to in some books as just the Schwartz inequality. Um, actually, one of my numerical analysis textbooks is referred to as the Cauchy Schwartz Bunyakovsky um, inequality. Uh, but most of the time, Bunyakovsky, whoever that is, has been shut out of recognition. Maybe because her name is too long. Um, I don't know. Didn't um, say it? Both. What? I said no one can say it. Yeah, so maybe. Um, well, in fact, um, you know, the, the guy who developed, let's give him credit for developing the first numerical algorithm for computing the eigenvalues of a matrix, um, actually discovered it around the same time as uh, someone in Russia did. But this first guy seems to get the credit, and, well, he has a simple name, John Francis. So maybe there's something to that. I don't know. Um, although, as I've mentioned in some of my classes, he had no idea he was famous for it until my advisor tracked him down 40 years later to tell him. Um, go figure. Um, OK. Um, so the coaching force inequality um, states that the absolute value of the inner product of uh, two functions um, is less than or equal to the product of the norms of those two functions. Assuming that we're using the induced norm, the so normal function f is square root of the inner product itself, as we've been using. Um, OK. Um, I'm going to go ahead and prove this for two reasons. One, it shows you um, it's a good exercise in uh, 
using different properties of inner products and norms. Also, it's fun. Um, okay. So I'm going to assume, and this is without loss of generality, that your function g is um, uh, non-zero. Because if it is zero, then well, on both sides, you're going to have zero. Um, OK. Um, and I'm going to let c be a real number. Um, it's not really going to matter whether it's real or complex as far as the proof goes. It can easily be adapted. Um, so then the inner product of f minus cg with itself, oh, that reminds me, I just spotted another typo in the notes. Um, Oh, we're going to end up dividing by its norm okay. later. Yeah. Um, so really, you bring out two cases. First, assume it is zero, in which case both sides are zero, and it's trivially true. Or, okay. All right. So this, in a product of f minus cg of itself, well, that happens to be the norm of f minus cg squared. So that has to be greater than or equal to zero. Um, but now we can expand this out um, using the properties of the inner product. So zero is less than or equal to, so, so using the linearity of the inner product, we get um, inner product of f with itself minus c. Um, see, am I assuming it? Oh, um, yeah, actually, I, um, I'm assuming everything is real here, uh, just to simplify certain details of the proof. But like I said, it can be generalized to the complex case. So, assume our vector space consists of real value functions. Um, so C, F inner product of G, minus C, G inner product of F. Because C is real, I don't have to conjugate it. And then I have plus C squared inner product of G itself. Um, and then what I'll do is, because everything is real, F inner product of G is the same as G inner product of F. Otherwise, I'd have to do a complex conjugation. Um, but this is the norm of f squared. And then I have minus 2c f inner product of g plus c squared inner product of, or, sorry, sorry, norm of g squared is uh, greater than or equal to 0. OK. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe this as a function. I'll call it h of c. Um, and what I'm going to do is, I'm going to try to find out where this function is uh, minimized. What, what value of c makes this as small as possible? Because I can treat this as a differentiable function of c. So you think of c being a variable and everything else being a constant. What is h prime of c? So if you differentiate this with respect to c. Negative 2. Yeah, c squared derivative is 2c, norm of g squared. And now we set it equals 0. And so it's like you did in calculus 1, finding the you know, maximum minimum function in case you want the min. Take it derivative, set it equals 0. So in that case, what is c? Two um, yeah, but the twos cancel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
So it's f interplug g over norm g squared. This is why we need to assume that g is not zero. Um, okay. Um, so now what we can do is substitute that back into here. Um, and once we do all that, um, see if I can squeeze it in over here. So zero is less or equal to all of x squared minus two f inner product g over g squared inner product f g plus inner product f g over over g squared whole thing squared. Um, and what's going to happen is these two terms are actually going to be the same except for the coefficient because I have inner product of f and g squared and then here I have norm of g squared over norm of g to the fourth so that's norm of g squared in the denominator so this condenses to norm of f squared minus norm of uh, inner product of f g squared over norm of g squared. Mm -hmm. And now, if I rearrange this and take the square root of both sides, I get exactly the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, or whatever you want to call it. All right, so it's rather the usual approach to approach to introduce this constant c, uh, but it works. I've seen other proofs of Cauchy Schwartz, and um, they're a lot more tedious than this. Um, also, this is, this, yeah, this is a lot more general, like it works for function spaces, or you can do a similar proof on uh, Rn, for instance, and it would work the same way. Okay. Um, now, uh, okay, I only have a few minutes, so I'll do one last thing. Um, <clears throat> thing stage for taking expansions of functions in some basis. Okay. Ah. Thank you. Give the metro time to copy that. Okay. Well, at least I only forgot that one time. All you got right? was six letters written. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a lot better than last time. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. Well, yes, because it was caught early. Okay. So, final expansion. Um, okay. So, suppose we have we have a Hilbert space H that has a basis. That is orthogonal All right, so these phi's are orthogonal. What I mean by that is the inner product of phi i with phi j is zero whenever i is not equal to j. Now whenever i equals j, it has to be positive because you're taking the inner product of itself norm squared. Um, so if we have that, um, because it's a Hilbert space, it's complete. So any function f in the Hilbert space has to be expressible as some linear combination of the feeds. So it's these coefficients a sub n that we want. Um, so what we do is take the inner product of both sides with one of these basis functions. Well, let's use b sub m. Um, okay. Now on the right side, I can use the linearity of the inner product. I can pull the summation out. Um, and 
I can pull the a sub n out. And all this left is either product of vm with vm. But if these are orthogonal. So all of these inner products are going to be zero except when? When they're equal. Except when n equals m. Yeah. Yeah, when the subscripts are equal. Yeah, so what's left is going to be a m inner product of phi m with itself. Um, so now I have this expression equal to this. So that lets me trivially solve for a m. It is the inner product of phi m with f over inner product of phi m with itself. So that is why we like orthogonality. Um, it lets you compute all the coefficients of, uh, in your expansion um, independently of the other ones. You're not having to solve some god awful system of linear equations. And the inner product of phi m with itself is just the norm of phi m squared, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but this would be more convenient if um, all these fees, or phi's, I guess we should be calling them, are orthonormal, meaning that the inner product of phi i with phi j is equal to, again, 0 if i is not equal to j, and 1 if i is equal to j. Um, so basically all we're doing is we're normalizing all of these basis functions. So if we divide each one by, uh, by its norm, um, then we um, have this property. So in other words, this denominator is equal to 1 if the basis functions are not just orthogonal, but orthonormal. So all you have to do is take the inner product of each one of f. So it, it just simplifies the formula. So Ortho, orthogonality is quite convenient by itself. Orthonormality is even better. Um, and we're going to um, try to work with orthonormal bases um, whenever possible. And I believe I really am out of time now. Yes, one minute over. Um, OK, but we will continue discussing orthonormal expansions um, on Monday, because I still have five pages of notes left. Four and a half. Okay.